Well, I became a Christian middle of my junior year in college. Uh, before I was a Christian, I uh, used to, yeah, uh, my life was very much about uh, enjoying life in all of the ways that the world provided. And I often wanted to rally as many people in doing that as possible and have big parties. And well, after I got converted, I felt a very distinct burden from the Lord to tell all of my friends that I used to party with about Jesus. And I wasn't quite sure how to, to do that. So um, another friend, Jason Seville, and I, who had, he had recently come to know the Lord as well, we, we started praying and asking God what we should do. And I got a, I got a bright idea. So I went to the pastor of the, the church that we were at at the time, Owen Womack, um, and uh, sat him down and said, Owen, here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking I'm going to throw a kegger at my house. Uh, and about halfway through, I'm going to turn on the lights, get on the keg, and I'm going to preach about Jesus. What do you think? And he said, well, I appreciate your zeal for the gospel, and how about this? <laughs> how, about, how about this? How about we let you use our church? Uh, you can use a church building for anything you want to do up here, just no keg. How's that? Uh, and I said, okay, sounds like a deal. So Jason and I started praying, and I think I had what was a legit vision from the Lord where I saw in that church building every seat filled, windows open, people hanging in the windows, balcony filled, back doors open, people standing in it. And we began to pray that God would do just that. And so we planned this thing called Christ Night. And uh, Christ Night, uh, oh man, uh, it's, uh, so many interesting things with this, but uh, publicized this and and everybody in the town, we're from a small town in West Virginia, and everybody knew Jason and I for our, our crazy wild ways before. Um, so now they think that this is a big joke, that there's a party at a church. So that night, hundreds upon hundreds of people showed up, and literally every seat was filled, and people were sitting in the windows, and the back door was, was packed with people. I still remember Keith, who used to, to hate God, standing there looking at me. Um, and that night, we, we proclaimed the gospel, and we told about what Jesus had done in our lives and how he, he had changed us, and we proclaimed Christ as the way, the truth, and the life. And I'm glad none of those sermons were recorded because I'm sure there's a lot of weird stuff that we said, but Christ was presented, and we had pleaded. And I tell you what, in a way that I haven't seen since, there was legit revival. Dozens upon dozens of people got converted. We had two more meetings. The next two were so large that they had to be in the high school gymnasium that was full. Um, I still remember, I think it was at the second one, there was a guy named Ricky Love who was sitting up in the back row. He came with a pocket full of crack rocks to sell. He was looking for people to, to sell them to at that thing, and he heard the gospel, and he came down front. We did altar calls at that time, and he, he gave his life to Christ, and today he's a pastor um, in that town. Um, it was amazing. Like God legit saved a lot of people. And when I think about that, I think the word of God prevailed in that town. And, and when I think about it, I think, wouldn't it be amazing to see it happen here? Could God not do that in Alexandria, Virginia, in Washington, D.C., where the word of God just catches on fire like, like a match on gasoline and just goes forth? Wouldn't we love to see that? How does that happen? Well, on the one hand, it's very much 100% God. I wasn't seeking God. He sought me. He gave us the idea. It was very much God. But at the same time, there was also people who were willing to proclaim the gospel, and God used that. It's exactly the same thing that we see happening in the book of Acts, where God moves on a people and changes them, and they go forth, and they herald the gospel, and the word of God prevails, and people from every tribe, tongue, and nation are getting saved. And the ripple effects are evident because this room is filled with those sorts of people. This is exactly what we're seeing in the book of Acts chapter 19. That the word of God is prevailing in this city in Ephesus. And, and we want to consider this, mo this morning, how can we, what does God call us to do as we see evidence in the way that Paul ministered how can we imitate that so that we might see the word of God prevail in our day again? Completely understanding that it's got to be God who does it. But, but what can we do? Acts chapter 19. As we come through verses 1 through 20, our big idea is this. 
that God's word prevails when we define gospel reality, declare God's reign, and demand genuine repentance. God's word prevails when we define gospel reality, declare God's reign, and demand genuine repentance. Our outline will follow that big idea. We'll see in verses 1 through 7. We need to define gospel reality, define gospel reality. Verses 8 through 17, declare God's reign. And then verses 18 through 20, demand genuine repentance. Let's look at verses 1 through 7, define gospel reality. It happened while Apollos was at Corinth. Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who is to come after him. That is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were about 12 men in all. Back in chapter 18, verse 27, where we were last time in the book of Acts, we saw Apollos was sent out by the church at Ephesus to minister in Achaia. That's where Corinth is, and that's where the Corinthian church fell in love with his, his preaching and, and wanted him to, to, to come back, more of that in 1 Corinthians. Well, this Ephesian church wanted Paul to stay. But do you remember Paul said, no, I've got to go. I'm going to follow up with the other churches. But he said what? you remember? I'll return if, if the Lord wills. Well, evidently the Lord willed. Uh, so after returning, uh, or after visiting all those churches in, uh, that he had planted in the first missionary journey, he returns to Ephesus, and he is going to post up here for two and a half years. Now, since he's going to be in Ephesus for so long, I think it's important just to note a couple things about the, this city. We just went through a series in Ephesus, so it should be fresh for us. But Ephesus was a, it was a magnificent city. It was the, the center, a significant center of trade in, in, in the Roman province. Think of it as, it was a port city, so think of it as kind of the, the New York City of Asia Minor. Ephesus was a big deal. It was, it was a prominent, prominent city. It was also a, a mystical city. It was, it was home to one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the, the temple Artemis or Diana. We're going to see more of that in the next part of, of, uh, of chapter 19 when we're in it in two weeks. But another thing that's very significant for our time together today is that it was a magical city. Not Disney World kind of magical, but like it was a magic city. The city had a fascination with magic. It was a primary training center for divination. It was Hogwarts, okay? This is what it was. Is that right, Ben Robin? Hogwarts? Yeah, okay, just check. Um, so that's, that's, but that's how it was viewed, right? This was the place that the witches and the sorcerers came to, to hone their craft. So as, as Paul rolls into town, he, he found some disciples, it says here. And he speaks with them. And as he does, he notices something is just not quite right. Have you ever talked to somebody that you assumed was a Christian, but the longer you're talking to them, you're like, eh, something's strange here. Well, this is happening in his conversation with them. In verse 2, he, he asks them, he says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Because there's, some, there's something missing in their conversation. And they reply, we haven't heard of the Holy Spirit. Now, I think this means a couple things. First of all, I think it means it's obvious that these disciples had not been meeting with Priscilla and Aquila. Because Priscilla and Aquila, who had remained behind, would have been very clear about everything that they're not clear on. It's also, I think, pretty unlikely that they had never heard of the Holy Spirit at all. The Holy Spirit's work is prominent through the Old Testament. And I think it would, it would assume that they probably had heard about the, the work of the Spirit. But likely, they had not heard that Jesus had sent the Holy Spirit at, and, and fulfilled it in, in Acts chapter 2. That they had a, a big blank slate from, from basically the time of John the Baptist on that they didn't know. We don't know why they didn't know, but they, they didn't know. 
And we learn in verse 3 that Paul understood that they received John's baptism. Now, if you remember at the beginning of the, all the Gospels, you've got this guy, JTB, who comes on the scene, John the Baptist. Uh, John was the forerunner for the Messiah. He was the final Old Testament prophet that came on the scene and said to everybody, the religious leaders of the day are corrupt, do not follow them, come out of Jerusalem and be baptized with a baptism of repentance. Prepare your heart for the way of the Lord because one who is greater than me is coming, pointing to Jesus. That was John's message. And all sorts of people were getting baptized into that message because they could see the corruption of the religious leaders of the day and they heard him saying, Messiah, is he's rolling in in just a minute. Be watching for him. Prepare your, your hearts. Well, evidently, they heard this true message of John, these guys did, and had been baptized in John's baptism, a baptism of repentance, waiting for fulfillment, and then they rolled out of town, and they didn't hear the rest of the story. And, and John's message, you've got to understand, it was incomplete. It was always about, John 3.30, he, Jesus, must increase and I must decrease. And, and that's exactly what Paul makes clear in verse 4. John's baptism of repentance was intended to lead you to believe in the one who was to come after him, namely, Jesus. You see what Paul is doing for them here? He is defining gospel reality for them. He, he's clarifying things that they were unclear about. Now, was Paul being unnecessarily clear here about their, their faith? Couldn't he have just said, hey, listen, I'm, really, I'm glad that works for you. I'm really glad that you were baptized into John's baptism. Because, I mean, everything that they had believed was true up to that, that point, right? He, couldn't he have just said, well, hey, listen, keep, keep on that path and I hope it goes well for you. No, he could not. You see, because what you believe about Jesus matters. And it would have been pastoral malpractice and unloving to leave them in their incomplete faith. It's, it's not, hear this, it is not loving to leave people with an unclear understanding of who Jesus is, what he has done, and what he requires of them. In a day and age that we live in where everybody is like, your truth, if that's your truth and it works for you, then I'm happy for you and I'm not going to step on any toes, this pluralistic nonsense that everybody's way is just fine. Paul's having none of that with these guys. And these guys are on the right track. They're heading in the right direction. He does not allow them to, to stay in their error. Paul needed to clarify the gospel. Their hope, he would not allow their hope to rest on some sort of incomplete, improper hope. They needed to look to Jesus. They needed to see him as the God-man who indeed come, came just as John the Baptist said he would. But he did more after that. He worked miracles to prove he had authority. And then he went to the cross. And there he suffered and he died. He shed his blood for sinners like them and like me and like you and like people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. He shed his blood because somebody's got to pay for your sin. And it's either going to be you or me for paying for our own sin under God's wrath for eternity in hell or is a kind, wonderful, merciful Savior who comes and stands in the place of sinners and receives the wrath of God in their place. Jesus, who then went into the grave and three days later he did what nobody else does when they go in the grave. He raised from the dead, victorious, bodily, physically, up from the grave to show now with his authority over death, over sin, over Satan, that he said, if you will turn and believe, you will be forgiven. They needed to hear that truth, and they also need to hear the truth that now he's gone, and he, he's ascended, and he's interceding, and one day soon and very soon, he is going to return and judge the world, and they were not okay in their incomplete understanding. They needed, they needed gospel reality defined for them, and this is exactly what Paul did. He defined it for them. It says on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When they heard the gospel, they responded in faith. They said, yes, we believe that. And then they were baptized in the, the name of, of the Lord Jesus. Now, another question. 
was Paul here being legalistic about their baptism? Couldn't he have just said, hey, listen, glad your baptism worked for you. You, you have the baptism of John. That's sufficient here. We don't, need to, we don't need to baptize you. No, because what you believe about Jesus, what you believe about the work of the Holy Spirit, what you believe about baptism matters also. This is, by the way, one of the reasons Delray Baptist Church appro approaches baptism in the way that we do. There are, there are baptisms that we will, we will not receive in, if somebody's coming in as, to, to wanting to be a member here, not because we're just trying to be some super duper exclusive club, but rather we want to help you be faithful to Jesus and the gospel realities that he brings. This is why we are not a, a pedo Baptist church, or that means baptizing children who have not who are potential disciples. So we wouldn't so if you were baptized as a child, which I was twice, once when I was thoroughly unconscious at like, I don't know, like wee bitty. And then when I was 13 in the Methodist church, uh, where I certainly didn't believe any of it, but I got confirmed um, and got sprinkled again. But both those times were not baptism. I was just a wet sinner. That's all it was. And I'm not, being, I'm not throwing shade at anybody, but it's just not what baptism is. Jesus commands disciples to be baptized, not potential disciples. So this is one of the reasons that we, wanna, we would not receive someone into membership, because we actually think that you should obey Jesus and be baptized. It's also why sometimes, you, if you've been here for a while, you've probably heard testimonies of somebody who maybe came out of a Roman Catholic background or a Mormon background or Jehovah's Witness background where they were baptized in that church or a, a Church of Christ. If you're from the South, a lot of times Church of Christ, not all Church of Christ believe this, but some Church of Christ uh, churches believe that their baptism actually gives you salvation. So if that was what you were baptized into, we would say that you've not been baptized into the true gospel and you should be baptized aligning with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. So it should be really clear that I think that we aim to model ourselves after the ministry of Paul here who says, what you're baptized into matters a whole lot. And he does, he, he baptizes them here. And then verse 6, he shows off some apostolic power. Paul had laid his hands on them and the Holy Spirit came on them speaking in tongues and prophesying. Now again, I want to say that this is a unique apostolic ministry where God is uniquely um, showing divine affirmation. Because you, you might say, well, if, if you're going to treat baptism in that way, then why aren't, you, why aren't you doing the same thing here with laying hands and prophesying and speaking in tongues and all that kind of stuff? Well, this is where I think it's important for us to just notice throughout the book of Acts the way that this yet unique demonstration of being filled with the Spirit, the speaking in tongues, is, is used by, by the Holy Spirit. So tongues is a spontaneous language that's spoken by the, the Spirit gives utterance and enables someone to speak a, a spontaneously a, a language. It shows up three times in the book of Acts, this unique filling of the Spirit. First time is in Acts chapter 2 in Jerusalem where the Holy Spirit comes on Pentecost and the Jews there speak in tongues. The second time is in Acts chapter 10 in Judea, Samaria. Where the gospel falls, or the gospel comes, the Holy Spirit falls on them, fills them with the Spirit, and there the, in Judea and in Samaria, they speak in tongues as evidence that the Spirit's moved. And now, here in chapter 19, in Ephesus, in the outermost parts of the earth, you have these Gentiles where the gospel falls on them and they speak in tongues. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, outermost parts of the earth. Where have you heard that before? That's Acts chapter 1, verse 8. It's the first section that we went over in the whole book. Jesus gives his commission to the church to be witnesses of me in Jerusalem, chapter 1 through 7, Judea, Samaria, chapter 8 through 10, and to the outermost parts of the earth, there, there and on. At each of those major stops along the way, God uniquely demonstrates his power, his presence, by manifesting this work, this, this fruit of the Spirit, where people are speaking in tongues as a testimony, God's word is going among the nations. That's what's happening here. And this is, an, this is a work of, of indeed, the, the Spirit. Well, we see we're left over now in verse 7 with these, these 12 men and all. Pretty interesting, right? You have 12 men who were in line with the message of 
John the Baptist, who heard about Jesus and his finished work, who now have received the Holy Spirit and are taking the gospel now to the ends of the earth. Very similar to what we saw happening with, with the disciples in, in chapter 1. Now before we move on, I just want to just say on this defined gospel reality. So when we're thinking about pleading for God to work in our day to see the gospel take root in our lives, in our families, in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, one of the most important things we have to be willing to do is to define gospel reality for people. To define, to clarify gospel, the truth about who Jesus is and what he's done. Reality, that the truth that there is truth in, in our day, and it is in line with God's word and God's work. So we must be very careful to not shy back from this. We live in a day where saying that there is truth and that others could be wrong is seen as bigoted hate speech, as self-righteous, pompous talk. I just want to say that that is, that is not the way that God thinks about it. God is true, and he's given his word, which is true, and he fills us with his spirit, who helps us to speak truth. Our job is to love people by not leaving them in their error. It is not loving to leave people in their error. It is loving, rather, to point them to clear gospel realities in regards to the exclusivity of Jesus, that he's the only way, and what he requires of us, that he requires us. Uh, are all, which is what we see in the second point, that we need to also declare God's reign, declare God's reign. So we want to define gospel reality, but we also want to declare God's reign. Let's look at verse 8 here. He, Paul, entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years, so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs, or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. That's wild. Well, this is Paul's pattern. It's been on display all the way through the book of Acts, and here he goes again. He goes to the Jew first. He comes to the, the synagogue there where there's no sacrifices, but they would have read the law, read the prophets, they would have had prayers and songs and all of that. And he evangelized enduringly there. He's there for three months in that synagogue. Every Sabbath showing up and reasoning from the scriptures. Probably throughout the week he's doing the same thing. This, by the way, I think is Paul's longest stay in a synagogue. He, he typically goes for a little bit, has some rocks thrown at him, and then withdraws. But he is staying here for, for three months, which is a long time. Day in, day out. Week in, week out. Month in, month out. And while he's there, you notice he's, he's doing three things. He's speaking boldly. Uh, the word boldly means openly, confidently, without fear of who is listening, which is instructive to us, right? That as we seek to define gospel realities and we seek to declare God's reign, one of the most important things that we can do is remember that we have an audience of one. It's one of the most liberating things in your evangelism. It's one of the most helpful realities in your, in your discipling of one another. Is to remember that in the end, what matters most is that we say what we say and we say how we say it, ultimately to please God because he's listening. That enables you to be bold. Because if you're just trying to impress people, if you're ensnared to people and their opinions, the fear of man lays a snare. It's a trap. You will not be able to remain faithful to God's word if your desire is to make everyone happy and to make everyone like you. If you're a Christian, you're supposed to have died to that. The, the new reason for living is to make everybody love Jesus, to help them see him for who he is by lifting up the truth about him. So as you're about to have conversations with people that are very hard, pray that God would help you to be bold by seeking to speak 
for him in a way that pleases him. Make it ultimately about him, which is, by the way, what's good for other people. What pleases God is good for people. He's also reasoning with them here. He, the word means to dispute or to argue or to have some sort of formal convincing speech. If you were ever in debate, it's something like that, right? So he's, he's debating God's word with thoughtful, scriptural reasoning aimed at changing their mind. He wants to pre present proofs from the scriptures to show the way you interpret the scripture is not faithful, but and the reason is because it's not pointing to Jesus. And then he would highlight for them how it, how it was supposed to. And not only that, but he also wants to persuade them. The word means to convince someone to believe, uh, to get them to respond to something. This, this dialogue over God's word was to get them to respond rightly. 2 Corinthians 5.11, Paul speaks of this. He says, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. He's trying to impress upon their, their intellect and their affections in a way that, that moves them. He wants them to hear it and to believe it. It's almost as if he's pleading with them, which is what the, the art of persuasion is. You're, you're showing people this is true and that you believe it. It's not acting, but it's allowing the, 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 the life of Christ and the, the truth of God's word to fill you and to em, you embody it in a way as you're, you're declaring it. And he's doing all this dialoguing about Notice here, the kingdom of God. This is what he's, he's reasoning about and persuading over, is the kingdom of God. Now, the kingdom of God is the reign of God on earth through the risen, ascended, enthroned Lord Jesus. Jesus is the Messiah who rose from the dead, who reigns now, and will soon return to judge the earth. His kingdom now is a spiritual one. And to enter into that, you must repent of your sin and believe in him and now live for him. Because he's king, because he's Lord, you follow him as such. I want to be really clear about that because I don't know what, what kind of brand of Christianity you grew up. And especially if you came out of the south, there's this nonsense gospel down there where you can have Jesus as Savior but not as Lord. Whatever that is, that's not in the Bible. Jesus is, his his. His saviorhood and lordship is a package deal. You, you don't get to have your sins forgiven and then just live however you want. Whatever that is, that's a that's satanic approach to Christianity. It's called hypocrisy. It's a lie. That does not work. Rather, a, receive, a call to receive Jesus as savior is also a call to submit to him as lord. You either get both or you get none. The good news of the gospel is that you don't get to rule your life anymore. Now, some of y'all are like, I don't like that. I like to rule my life. And then some of y'all are like, praise the Lord, because I sure messed it up. <laughs> the second one is a heart that has been at a good dose of reality and understands that following your own heart and living your own way does not lead to life. But rather that the way of Jesus is wise and true and good. And because he made you, he knows what's best for you. He loves you. And he says, follow him. Well, that's good news for a lot of people, but not for everybody, verse 9, or at least they don't receive it as such. Not everybody wanted to hear this good news. Some became stubborn. The, the word means to, be, to formally harden the heart, to be obstinate. It's the word used in the, in the Septuagint, the Old Testament uh, Greek translation, of, of Pharaoh toward Moses and toward God. He hardened his heart. He became stubborn. As this gospel truth comes in, like, no, I don't like that. And in light of that, not only they become stubborn, but they continued in unbelief. They refused to believe, but they didn't just going to be like, this is a personal resistance, but they also go public about it, speaking evil of the way. They revile, they insult, they call a curse down on the way. Right? So notice here, they're not, they're not content with their own disbelief. But they wanted to do whatever they could do to make sure that nobody else listens to this kingdom of God nonsense, gets enslaved by these, this religious guy who's coming in and trying to get everybody in his little club, not to follow the way. Now, the way is a nickname for Christians. Now, where, where did Christians kind of get that nickname? Anybody know? It's something Jesus said in the Gospel of John. 
Jesus said, I am the... And no one comes to the Father but through me. Amen. Yes. Good. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father but through me. That's who Jesus said that he was. And what it means to be a Christian is that you stop going your way on the broad way that many are on, and now there's a narrow way that he paved with his blood. The book of Hebrews says he is our forerunner. It's a picture of somebody kind of walking through the jungle, clearing the way with a machete. Jesus did that for us. He paved the way to glory, paved it with his blood, and now he says, follow me. He's the good shepherd leading the sheep home. We've said this many times here, but I want to be really clear. Do all roads lead to God? Yes, all roads lead to God. But only one leads to him as father. Every other road leads there and meets him as judge. The only way to meet God as father rather than judge is to look to the one who is judged in your place, the Lord Jesus, and rose and now calls you to follow him in reconciliation to the father. He is the way. Listen, just as in the first century, in our day, where everybody says there's many ways, it is true there's many ways. And everybody's got to make a decision about which way they're going to follow. But Jesus says, if you want to make it to the kingdom of the Father, to be with him forevermore in a land where there's no more crying or tears or pain, if you want to know the most in this life, the abundant life, then what you've got to do is forsake the way that everybody else is going and follow me. He is the he is the way. This is part of our responsibility to, to proclaim this. Well, after three months, he chose to step back from the synagogue. Hearts were too hard. Um, the resistance was too heavy. And he chose to refocus his efforts. Verse 9, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him. So notice, some listened, some believed. He took them with him. Now he's reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. So Paul here, notice here, there comes a time where he thinks... I've, I've been very clear for a very long time. It's obvious that you are not listening. And he, he leaves them to their error, and he goes to another place to try to, to minister the gospel. This, by the way, is something I think every Christian will experience along the way with friends, family members, coworkers. There'll be just a time when you're like, you know what? I feel like we've had as many conversations as we can. I'm always available if you want to talk more. But I'm, gonna, I'm just going to leave this alone for now, and I'm going to focus somewhere else. I'll continue to pray and ask God to move, but we're going to focus somewhere else in regards to efforts in ministry. And for Paul, he took his talents to the hall of Tyrannus. Uh, it's interesting, the word hall means skule. That's the Greek word. Where do we get, what word do we get? Yeah, even I knew that one, right? School. school. <laughs> uh, it's a lecture hall. Um, owned by somebody named Tyrannus. Maybe he was a mean guy. I don't know why he had that name, but there he is. Um, now, some people claim uh, that this, this school was in session from 11 to 4. I'm not sure where they get the writings for that, but that was, that was a claim. But the, the, the idea here is that he had some sort of regular slot in this school where philosophers and magicians would have come in and been teaching. He had some regular slot there, which is also important to understand. A lot of times we can just think of Paul as kind of full-time pastor guy. He wasn't always that. He also had a side hustle. He was bivocational. He was always making tents on the side. But I think it's really important to notice here. He's, he's going to have his normal job that he's doing, and he's going to be ministering as he has opportunity, including probably over his, his lunch hour or something like that, where he's going to go into the school and he's going to be teaching, proclaiming the way of Christ, and then coming back out and, and going about. Which as I was thinking about that more, I... What a good thing to begin to pray about for you. What opportunities are there for you in the place where you spend most of your time to try to start some sort of, of scripture conversation? So uh, maybe if you're a high school student and you're, and you're in public school or you students who are at Georgetown or whatever other uh, college you might be at, how are you leveraging your, your lunch times or, or morning hours? Are there are there opportunities maybe where you are to start a conversation with people about the Bible? I remember when I was in Dubai for uh, one of the, the, the visits there, uh, we would go with this particular ministry onto college campuses at lunchtime, and we would all just scatter and sit with different people and ask them and start conversations and start conversations about Jesus and see if anybody was interested in reading the Bible. 
And sometimes yes, and sometimes no, but, but God brought people to faith through those sorts of efforts. Think of you men and women in your workplace. I know there's a number of you right now who have Bible studies that are happening either in the morning or over lunch hour every once in a while. Think about that. Pray about that. How, how might God use you to be bold in that place and to try to, to reason from the, the scriptures? If you'd like to talk more about how to maybe do that, please, the elders, that's one of the reasons we're here is to equip you for the work of ministry. We want to help you think about ways that you, you can do that. Well, verse 10, Paul made this his, his routine for about two years, and evidently it paid off. God used his daily faithful ministry of the word, and likely disciples as well, so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord. What an amazing idea. He had this approach that was aimed at, I want everybody in my neighborhood, I want everybody in my community, I want everybody in my city to hear the good news about Jesus. Delroy Baptist, think about this. I mean, look around. With this number of people, if everybody committed to, I want to be about that, and we went into our neighborhoods and into our workplaces, think about what all of that seed thrown on hearts might do. How might God use that? that, that those efforts about defining gospel reality and, and declaring God's reign, how might God use that? Plead with him to give you courage to do so. And you might think, well, if I was doing what Paul would do, it would be a little easier. Verse 11, God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. So that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and evil spirits came out of them. That's wild. That's some crazy wild stuff right there. Three considerations about this. Number one, this is undeniably God's power working here. How do we know? Because it says it, verse 11, God was doing miracles by the hands of Paul. So these healing and these exorcisms were by God's power, not by man's power. Second thing to notice here, this is an extraordinary ministry. How do we know? Because it says it right there, God was doing extraordinary miracles. So ordinary, extraordinary is not ordinary. Okay, so this is above and beyond normal miracles. So miracles are already amazing. Now you've got extraordinary miracles. This is beyond that. Okay, so this is, this is, I mean, I'll tell you what I read. The first thing I think of is TBN. I think of that dude at 2 a.m. in the morning who's got handkerchiefs that he dipped in, you know, in the, the Jordan River and then prayed over in the Holy Spirit. And if you, you know, put it on your head, you'll get healed and that kind of stuff. Like, that was my first thought on this. But, but that's, that's Satan imitating what God did here. This is, there's other strange instances like this. You remember where uh, Mark chapter 6, it says, As many as touched Jesus' garments were healed. The woman with the issue of blood just thought if I could touch his garments. Acts 5, you had Peter walking along and they're just trying to even get in his shadow because there were healings that were happening there. This is an extraordinary miracle. We just have to say this is not, not normal. But I think it's all tied to this. This is uniquely happening in Ephesus. What did we say at the beginning Ephesus was? It was a city of magic. It's a magic city. The streets are filled with witches and sorcerers and fortune tellers, tellers and necromancers and, and spell casters. You remember? How does Paul's letter to the Ephesians end? It's all about what? Spiritual warfare. I think... Through these miracles, uniquely as they are, God is meeting people where they are to show that his power is distinctly different than the power of all these supposed magicians in the city. He's showing by things that they even did with specially blessed you know, pieces of cloth or whatever it may be, he's showing that his power is the true power. Magic manipulates the gods and demons with chants and formulas. But a miracle is the sovereign God working through someone for his will. Magic may look real and at times may have real results. But in the end, only God's power in the name of Jesus who is reigning will prevail. I wish we had an exhibit of that. Well, we have exhibit A in verse 13. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists 
undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Verse 14. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. Here we meet these traveling Jewish exorcists, sons of a high priest named Sceva. And these guys are around town, and they've seen Paul casting out demons in the name of Jesus. And they get an idea. Why don't we start using the name of Jesus? And maybe, maybe uh, you know, our Instagram posts will go up, we'll get more followers, we'll get some more money. They're going to they're gonna tap into this power. Now, important to understand, exorcists typically, so non, not Christian, typically would use the powerful name of a god or a demon or an ancestor and invoke that name as part of a magical incantation to, to, to cast a spell or to bring a curse or to exorcise a demon. Now, there's a very deep irony here, right? You've got these guys who don't believe the gospel about Jesus, but they recognize the power of Jesus' name, so they're going to try to use it. And it backfires. Verse 15. <laughs> but the evil spirits answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize. But who are you? <laughs> this is one of those ones you'd love to have a little video of. <laughs> like, these seven supposed men of spiritual power have, they, they poked a, de a demonic bear in the eye. And it looks at them and it says, we know Jesus. We're familiar with Paul because Paul has been going out casting demons out everywhere. But who are you? <laughs> In the Hebrew or Greek, uh-oh <laughs> is what it says. <laughs> so the demon insults them and then attacks them. Verse 16. The man in whom the evil spirit, in whom was the evil spirit, leaped on them and mastered all of them, all seven of them, in one, in one fight, and overpowered them, so they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Well, that didn't go well, did it? <laughs> That's when you know you got whooped, when you got slapped naked, and then you're running home, right? I mean, screaming. Like, they, they got whooped right here. Remind me of a... So I grew up in a West Virginia public school, and there, were, there would be fights from time to time. And there's still one that I, re I remember where there was a football player who was in the locker room, and he was, he was picking on this kid he, con he considered a nerd. And he's saying mean stuff to him. And the guy just finally had, it, had enough, enough of it. This is not funny. Had enough of it. And he uppercut the guy and hit him in the stomach, and the football player went like this. He grabbed his shirt, pulled it over him, and then just started wailing on him. And afterward, the guy came out, and he was just, he, did, he was not right. He had, gotten, he had just gotten whooped. And when I saw this, I was like, that's the same thing. You've got this guy who thinks he's, they're going to come in and do it, and boom, backfires. These guys thought they had power just because they could hijack this name. They didn't have power. Th their magic had nothing. And they, get, they got whooped. It's really interesting. The word for leaped on here that's used it's used three times in the Old Testament for the Holy Spirit leaping on someone to empower them for God's purposes. Here, the opposite happens. Rather than these men displaying power over this spirit, this spirit jumps on them and whoops them. Spiritual powers of darkness, they're real and they're not anything to mess with. There's only one name that's above all of those names that makes them all bow. And his name is the name of Jesus. But the name of Jesus is not just some card that you can pull out of your pocket. It's not just some, some name that you can just use. It must be administered in faith. These men, they didn't know the Jesus that they talked about. And it was displayed so. I think it's interesting to note that on all three missionary journeys... You have gospel encounters with charlatans, spiritual imposters, and all these people who try to use Jesus' name to get power and wealth and a following. Right? You had, you had Peter with Simon the Magician, Paul with Bar G uh, Jesus, the demon slave girl, and now this again. 
Luke wants us to see again and again that the power of the Holy Spirit cannot be imitated. The person of Jesus cannot be used for personal gain. Rather, Jesus is the one who is powerful, right? Colossians 2.15, Jesus disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing them. He's the one who bound the strong man and whooped him and left him defeated. Jesus is the one who does that. But apart from him, there is no, there is no hope, there is no strength. Jesus here is glorified in this scene. Verse 17, this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. The fruit of this encounter, which again, I think the reason Paul was given these unique sorts of miracle powers in this city was to put on display that there is a miracle power that comes tied to the truth about the name of Jesus as recorded in the proclaimed word that is not the power that these magicians have in Ephesus. Jesus is the true God who reigns over everything and that everybody's got to get right with him or judgment is going to fall upon them. This is part of the gospel ministry. Which leads us to our final section, verses 18 through 20. We need to demand genuine repentance. Verse 18. Also, many of those who were now believers came, confessing and indulging their practices. Not indulging, they stopped doing that. Confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. We get this glimpse of the gospel's impact. The kingdom of God is being established. Jesus' reign is beginning to expand by the power of the Holy Spirit. From heart to heart to heart, from person to person to person. And it's, it's changing things. As the gospel infiltrates their hearts, it transforms their lives. The Holy Spirit was not only giving them a new life in Christ... But he's giving them new life with Christ. It's changing them. The gospel is. The Holy Spirit is coming and changing them. Believers come confessing, it says here. The word confess means to agree or admit. It's where God's word or his spirit takes the word and applies you and says, you did this. And you say, yes, I admit I did. That's what confession is. It's to agree with God. Divulging their practices, it means to report, to show, to disclose. This is interesting, by the way. A key to magic is that there's secrecy behind the spells and the curses. It's called the dark arts for lots of reasons, but one of them is that everything is hidden. And once a practice or a name that was used is made known publicly, it loses its power. Which, by the way, is exactly how sin works. It loses power in the light. Light is sin's kryptonite. And what's happening here is these believers are coming. And they're saying, i got to talk about what's going on. And they start confessing all of their sins, including the fact that they've been about this, this, this witchcraft stuff. The Holy Spirit is bringing conviction of, of sin and areas of life that are displeasing to God. Saying, Jesus wouldn't have that. Jesus wouldn't do that. Jesus wouldn't look at that. Jesus wouldn't say that. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, convicting them. And as he brings conviction, they bring confession. I don't know what it was like for you when you first became a Christian. I remember all of a sudden, because I used to, all I used to do was lie. That's all I used to do. Everything was kind of some sort of lie, and I'd lie to one person, I'd have to lie to another person, and lie to keep up with the lies. Well, I remember as soon as I became a Christian, all of a sudden, you ever seen that Jim Carrey movie, Liar, Liar? I'm not saying, I don't know whether it's a good movie or not, but I remember the premise of it is that he got to where he couldn't, he couldn't lie, and he'd be like, Grr. the same sort of thing started to happen to me. I remember I just was so used to lying, I would tell a lie, and then all of a sudden I'd get convicted, and I'd be like, oh, all right, remember that thing I told you? I totally just made, I made that up. That wasn't true. I just wanted you to think well of me. Ugh. And then I go over here and talk about something else and you just lie. You just have to just get convicted again and again. That's what's happening to them here. 
But notice here that confessing their sin is not sufficient. He demands that we repent of abiding sins, which is exactly what they did, verse 19. A number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. Now that's a serious evening service right there. <laughs> right? They're going to bring all the books and let's set them on fire. The Holy Spirit had convicted them and they confessed and then they repented. Again, I remember when I first became a Christian, uh, so I used to listen to gangster rap. That was just what I listened to. Um, and I remember driving down the road, and I, I had in Biggie Smalls, and I was listening to Biggie, and Biggie's lyrics were not, not edifying. And I, I remember I stopped, and I hit the eject button, the CDs. CDs are this metal thing that you used to put in a the, <laughs> era. So and I, hit eject, I hit eject, I know, uh, hit eject, and I remember I threw it out the window. And I grabbed next CD and put it in, and then Tupac, I was like, oh, Tupac, Tupac's got to go. Method man, I just all the guy after guy, I just had to just keep chucking him out the window. I'm not saying littering's good, but I was repenting. I just had to, and I went home, and I had all these movies, and I, I start watching a movie. I, I was, anyway, I remember watching this movie. I sat down with a couple friends and turned it on, and I mean, it was like three minutes into the movie, and it just became a prayer meeting. We're like, Lord, we're sorry. We just had to go through and get rid of all these movies. Like, I just had never seen this stuff before. Like, I had never seen it for what it was. It just was normal to me. And now the Holy Spirit's convicting and changing. I remember this one particular thing. My parents, so I used to be a fisherman. And all fishermen lie. And I, as a kid, I always wanted my parents to think I was a good fisherman. So this one day, we had this, we had this picture in our house of me holding this giant catfish. Um, well... My parents were, thought I caught the catfish because I told them I did. Well, the fact is, actually, some other guy had caught it, and I got a picture with it. And they had kept this up as like a beacon of their son's like, great fishermanry for like 25 years. <laughs> well, I remember I was about to preach one morning, and for some reason, I, was, I think I was going to go catfishing that afternoon or something like that, and I remembered, oh, no, the catfish picture. So I called mom and dad before the service, and I was like, so mom and dad, can you all sit down? You remember Remember that fish that's on the wall, the catfish picture? They're like, oh, yeah, we're so proud of you about that. And I was like, yeah, that was a lie. I, I didn't catch that fish. And mom was like, what? <laughs> and dad's like, I knew it. I knew you didn't catch that fish. <laughs> but it's like when you're a Christian, you just can't live with that stuff anymore. Because when the Holy Spirit encounters somebody, he says, we're taking over this place. We're going to change things. You remember Zacchaeus? He gets saved. He encounters Jesus. He was a tax collector who would mark up bills in order to defraud people. And you remember what Zacchaeus said after he encountered Jesus? He said, Lord, behold, Lord, half of my goods I'm going to give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I'll restore it fourfold. That's what happens when somebody becomes a Christian. They repent. You're not who you used to be. The Holy Spirit takes up residence in you and starts making you like Jesus. And that sort of confession, it's going to be costly sometimes, but you've got to see Jesus as worth it. They come in here, and they're, they're turning in their books, and they're burning them. And it's significant that they're burning them, because this is saying what? We're not going back. We're not going back. I remember we had a, a sister who went on a mission trip to Haiti, and she talked about sharing the gospel with somebody, and she was so convinced this woman was that, that her idols that she had, the family idols that were on her, her fireplace, they were now demonic relics. She took them and she burned them. And she did it through tears because she knew it was the right thing to do, but she knew this was going to cost her family and friends and social status. This is what's happening here. They are burning these books. They counted the value of them and it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. Assuming these were denarii, this is, this is roughly $5.5 million worth. The New Living Translation actually translated the value of the books for several million dollars. Not only though are they declaring we're not going back, this is also a foreshadowing of what is to come. Because on that last day, there is going to be a moment of judgment where Satan and all the demons behind the idols and all those who followed them will be cast into a lake of fire and the smoke will go up forever and ever. 
And the picture of, of this, this gospel call here, this demand for genuine repentance is either burn your sins now to the glory of God through repentance or burn in your sin under the wrath of God for all of eternity. And that is a weighty and unpopular word, but friends, it is true. God is a good God, and because he is good, he will deal with all evil, including yours and mine. And it will either be dealt with in full on the cross when Jesus paid it all and all to him we owe, or we will forever be under his wrath. Part of ministering the word is demanding for genuine repentance and clarifying the destiny of those who refuse to do so. The only right response to seeing Jesus for who he is is repentance. But listen, he is worth whatever he will cost you. He is worth whatever he will cost you. He is worth whatever he will cost you. Jesus said, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sister or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus is worth it in this life no matter what you've got to lose to have him. You gain brothers and sisters if you, if you lose your family. Not to make light of the pain of that, but look around. Jesus has kept his word and given you family. When you lose whatever you lose for him, he repays it in full. With persecutions, yes, there is suffering, but he is with you in the midst of it. And he promises a day, soon and very soon, where there will be eternal life, where sin shall be no more. Well, verse 20, the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. God's word here is being unleashed. And our job is to pray that God would work these sorts of revival miracles. And our job is to define gospel realities, to declare God's reign, and to demand genuine repentance and trust God to do the rest. So as we conclude, I want to ask you two questions. What do you need to bring and burn? Maybe not literally, but metaphorically, what is it that you need to bring and burn that is hindering your walk with, with Christ? Maybe there's some phone numbers of immoral relationships that you need to confess that you have and delete so you can't contact anymore. Maybe there's big business practices or partnerships that you need to cut off. Maybe there's secret sins that you need to disclose and then remove whatever means you have of accessing them. Maybe, maybe you're, you're into some witchcraft stuff. This, this, this happens in churches. I just want to be very clear. It is dangerous to mess with that stuff. God doesn't tell you to not to mess with it because there's nothing there, but because there is something there. And then finally, who do you need to declare the gospel to? Pray for divine appointments. Plead for divine intervention. Trust God for fruit. Boldly proclaim Jesus as king who is coming soon. Let's pray.